Thank you. Indeed, um, I have been looking at language servers, but uh, just to set expectations, that's not my normal research. So that's me being annoyed with bad tooling because dynamic languages need feedback and in our IDs, of course, we want nice IDE support. So um, I tried to do that a little bit interactive. Let's see how that works. Uh, we probably don't have the mics, but uh, if you have a question throughout, please just raise your arm and I will take that and repeat. To stick with the interactive bit, let's do a bit of show of hands. Who has implemented their own programming language? Okay, it's not 100%. I'm a little bit disappointed. All right. <laughs> um, next question, more to the talk. You have your own programming language. Now, do you have your own IDE, IDE plugin, language server, or whatever? Yeah, that's what I thought. So I do. Um, I have that uh, simple object machine, and I have that one language server, or at least that's what I started out with. Now, the beautiful thing is you have a lot of choice out there. All these different IDEs, you can choose whatever you like. Um, some people like Vim, others Visual Studio Code, or maybe even more old school, kind of a small talk style ID, Eclipse. And they all, they all can use the language server protocol and support my little researchy language. That's really nice. You get kind of nice tooling for that. Now, the problem is implementing those language servers is quite a bit of an effort. And especially for me, that's not my research, so I should be actually doing something entirely different. Um, I can't afford kind of implementing hundreds of lines of, hundreds of thousands of lines of code, or maybe on average or median, uh, 10,000 lines of code to get good tooling. So what I did here is look at the language server protocol wiki, grab 20 or so language servers, where I thought I recognized what the language is about, discard the test code and really kind of just look at the lines of code of the implementation. So it's a lot of effort to get good tooling. And there is a lot of duplication. So when I, saw, when I talk about tooling, I really mean kind of the standard IDE features. That means things like go to declaration, go to definition, so you command click on something and then you actually see the implementation of things. You find references. So everyone who's calling that method, things like that, um, Hoover information, signature help, all the cool little bits our IDEs do these days. Of course, I want that for my own language, right? So what I have to do is basically go and implement all that. And it's very similar to whatever the people did for Java or Ruby or Python or Camel or PHP. So there's a lot of kind of duplication. Now, uh, in 2016, I've been working with the Truffle stuff we heard about in the last session for quite a while. I wrote a back blog post and was thinking, hmm, can we actually do better? Can we kind of use all that information that we have in our language implementations and not just get kind of a just-in-time compiler for free, but maybe also an IDE for these kind of Truffle languages? Uh, Christian already spoiled a little bit of my presentation. Um, they have the Truffle language server. I will get to that in a little bit. But for me, on my own journey, it was kind of, okay, I wrote that blog post, and then I was supposed to do other things. And I'm still supposed to do other things, but uh, I did not what I was supposed to do. So six years later, uh, with the help of a bunch of students, we kind of had our own little solution to the problem. So we can still address all these different IDEs, but we kind of factored out all the common parts, at least for the implementation of dynamic languages. So we have a language agnostic language server. That's a mouthful, but the idea is basically we collect structural information for all these kind of IDE services like go to definition and whatnot, listing an outline view of everything that's in the file. So we just capture the structural information during parsing of our files. So that means the language specific parts over here is really just, we have to just adapt the parser to connect or collect the information that we need. And that way we kind of maybe not absolutely minimize, but reduce quite a lot of effort implementing these language servers and make it feasible for the kind of research languages we are interested in. In my specific case, 
all that's implemented in Java, and those are also Java-based languages. Um, but you could imagine applying the same approach if you start implementing the language server protocol as a library, provide that kind of framework um, as a feature of that protocol implementation. Now, how does it work? Well, the basic idea is B, kind of collect information during parsing. In the case of my research language, I basically just subclass the parser, so they're implemented in Java, and then at some point, so we have here, for instance, the parser rule to parse a class name, and for that, I would simply kind of record a semantic token, so that's giving us semantic highlighting in our ID, record the coordinates where it is in the file, the actual string, the name, and then what type of token we have. So the language server protocol defines all kinds of different types to enable semantic highlighting. I'm also starting an element. So an element, a language element, is kind of the structural representation we use for some specific type of uh, language concept because the class in many languages is kind of a thing that contains other things. So we start that and then when we end the parsing, we would close that element. And that's pretty much it. So we don't actually have to adapt the parser, depending on how we designed it. Here in that specific case, I can just call the superclass, let it do the actual parsing, and then get the information that I need. Now, how does the overall API look like? I talked about elements, so that's one of the key elements. So we basically represent things like classes, methods, variables, the classic language features uh, you have. There's a little bit of a connection to the language server protocol in terms of the types or kinds, as they call it, of language um, elements. Um, but uh, otherwise, it usually pretty much maps on what the various languages offer. We collect a little bit of basic details, like a name, the kind I mentioned, and the source location. And we also define a so-called element ID. That gives us a very basic mechanism of equality, which we will use for lookup. The key idea was to reduce the implementation effort. So here, I will, the framework does not really kind of provide fancy ways of implementing lookup, but we kind of use simple kind of Java-style equality equivalence classes, if you will, to define uh, lookup semantics. And that works surprisingly well. So what does an element ID look like? Well, it's basically, you can match it with other element IDs, so to determine, for instance, fuzzy matches, um, and then you implement hash code or equals in Java um, to define the equality. And we use that for code navigation, referencing, so who's calling that method, or where is it used, and so on, or what variable, uh, there's a variable definition here for the field we are reading. Things like that. For the actual recording of the structural information, um, we have the basic bits. So I can start an element, I can complete an element, or I record it in one go, for instance, just a variable definition. Of course, we want to be able to reference elements if I read the variable or call a function, that kind of stuff. And for semantic highlighting, we have the recording of tokens. And then also, of course, very useful if something goes wrong during parsing, or maybe you even have some kind of semantic analysis, some kind of linting support in your parser already, you can record any kind of diagnostics. And that's it. So the goal was to kind of reduce the effort for implementing language servers, and that was also reflected here in that API. Keep it small. Try to figure out the small minimum bits that we actually need to get decent IDE support. So that part is really provided by the API, and you just use it, and the only thing you really need to implement is um, the element ID for basic kind of lookup style uh, equivalence. All right, so what do we get for that? It's basic, very basic what we collect, so what does it give us? Um, since the instructions were we have to use a computer here, I didn't prepare a demo, but took screenshots. It's a bit boring, uh, but I suppose I uh, don't embarrass myself all that much. Um, so, of course, we get things like code completion, right? So here you get the classic code completion based on the names, in that case, uh, trying to code complete a function. Uh, what else do we have? 
Well, um, here on the side, we have an outline view. So for that class definition here, so that's the simple object machine language. Did I use a different language over here? Yeah, just to point out, that's actually a new speak. So just to uh, make that explicit, it's actually basically demos for different languages. But uh, here on the left-hand side, we have the outline view that you know from many IDEs. Uh, what we also have here is kind of a linting information. So I actually implemented a very basic language agnostic linter, which really just indicates uh, possible problems where you have kind of a, a reference to an element, but never find any matching definition for that element. And that's super helpful. I actually found bugs with that um, in our SOM SOM. Of course, we have a metacircular implementation of SOM. Why not? That's the research we do. Um, other features, things like go to definition. So in Visual Studio Code, you just on the Mac command click on that, and then you see all the candidates that's defined. So you have all the kind of classic things. And I don't know why Visual Studio messed up here, but of course, you also have Hoover, and you see kind of the um, the signature of the methods. And that's all derived from the very basic structural information that we collect. So you get probably like 80% of the IDE support for a dynamic language without doing anything language specific. So how does it look like in lines of code? Here in comparison, in the front, that's the languages we implemented. So that's, I think, for some, I took about 900 lines of code to implement the parser adaptions. And for the simple language, which is one of the demo languages of the Truffle people, um, it was about 500 lines of code, I believe. Of course, the point here being there's quite a step to the next language, and I don't even know how feature complete that is. If anybody is interested in how feature complete these language servers is, there was actually in the models conference a paper that surveyed all those. Uh, I wasn't able to reference it in that paper here because the paper just came out very recently. All right, so on what kind of types of parsers uh, did we try then and does it work? Well, it works really nicely for Antler-based parsers. So we tried it with simple language. The benefit of Antler is you have kind of really your grammar definition and Antler allows you to generate all kinds of extra things from that. So we didn't actually need to change any of the grammar, which in terms of maintainability and yet an extra tool is probably a really useful thing for a researcher because you can evolve your grammar and you don't have to, to worry that you have another copy lying around anywhere. So in that specific case, um, we can kind of generate the visitors and whatnot uh, to actually get all that information that we need for the ID out of the grammar without changing it a little bit. Um, for our recursive descent parsers, um, we basically uh, didn't need to change anything semantically about them. Sometimes we needed to make a private method uh, protective so we can override them in the, super, in the subclass, um, but that's about it. I also want to point out that, of course, all of these parsers have not been designed in any way for IDE use. So they're not error recovering, they're not incremental, um, they're classic batch mode parsers. So um, in SLE, we have seen a couple of papers or presentations where people worried about performance and made the things more incremental. Um, for these parsers, it turns out, it's probably would be useful, but it's not actually absolutely necessary. It kind of just works. It's good enough, which for many of our research systems is all we care for, right? It's good enough. We have extra tooling that helps us to do the actual things we should be doing um, and don't get distracted and annoyed by bad tooling. So why do I claim it's good enough? Um, well, let's have a look at performance. So let's assume, worst case scenario, a single file with 10,000 lines of code. Um, so we hit here about, well, the 100 millisecond range. So parsing a file with 10,000 lines of code doesn't take much more than 100 milliseconds. And that's good enough for interactive feedback. So what we do is actually we parse every single time um, we get from the IDE an updated file buffer, the whole thing. And it's fast enough. And if you want to have files with 100,000 of lines of code, 
I hope they are generated and you don't want to actually modify them. So, yeah. All right. Um, I skipped a little bit. Uh, since Christian already spoiled that bit, let me just go back. So in 2016, I wrote that blog post, and then uh, some cool people in Potsdam actually picked up um, that idea and went the other way. So I here presented um, how we collect data during parsing, which takes some effort, right? We have to adapt the parsing to collect that information. They went the whole extreme way. So how can you get information for an IDE without requiring any or almost any changes by the language implementer. And that also works pretty cool. Um, you basically, the one requirement is you have to use a truffle framework uh, and you have your, to tag your AST nodes. So that's close to zero effort. Um, when I looked at the languages, it's 10 to 20 lines of code you actually have to do. So there is one extra assumption. You already kind of bought into the truffle um, ecosystem. So you support the interop uh, features Christian talked about, and they are, for instance, useful for debugging. And if you do dynamic languages, of course, you also strongly believe in debuggers, right? So you will already have that anyway. So that means with their approach, you use or require less effort than what we did, 500 to 900 lines of code. Instead, uh, you have just 10 to 20 lines of code. But the one drawback is you actually have to be able to execute your code. So, but in that scenario, the language specific parse is really just the tagging of AST nodes. And then you have the language server, the Truffle language server, which kind of has the common parts that you don't have to implement, like data extraction, code runner, and all the necessary features to support the different um, IDE features. Now, the drawback, as I said, you need to execute that code. So you don't necessarily get a lot of static information. In Truffle, you get static information of um, where is a function. And um, yeah, that's, that's mostly it. You have kind of the static AST. You can possibly get some information from the AST tags. So of course, if you need to execute it, an incomplete fragment-like code, here I implement kind of a vector class, classic thing like in Java. Um, and I start somewhere in the middle. Of course, you don't get any, stop somewhere in the middle, you don't get any IDE features until you actually completed the first pass successfully. So that's uh, a bit annoying. Um, of course, one of the nice features of modern IDEs is the semantic highlighting, and they can't support that either because Truffle doesn't care about token information. You have an AST, right? So that's already a level above um, your token stream. So um, these bits of information are simply not available. Okay, so let's have a little bit more in-depth comparison. The things that work pretty well in both approaches is things like listing the outline views, the symbols for local variables. You also kind of can figure them out in Truffle and functions. Go to definition, reference and highlight, code completion, all for locals and functions. So that works well. Syntax errors, the same, of course. If the parser stops, you can capture that information. Now, where we see differences is, for instance, when it's about globals and properties. Those are things that are not generally known to the Truffle framework. Those are only known at runtime. So you actually have to execute things. And then you get support for go-to definition and so on. Um, things like signature help, Hoover, linting, all that stuff, um, you also need to execute. However, for the execution bit, there are also benefits. Because we have been executing the program, we actually can observe what it did. So especially for functions, for instance, we know the call targets. So if you have all the functions called foo or uh, whatever your function is called, and you have 100 implementations of those, we can, of course, rank them at that specific call site based on what we actually saw during execution. So here, runtime information can be very helpful. Same is true for globals and properties. We can collect things like type information. And that's, that's really neat in an IDE for the dynamic language. You get that extra bit of information you typically only have in a statically kind of typed language. All right, so to wrap up, 
Um, what I'm proposing here is kind of a structure of how we can, with relatively minimal effort, not absolute minimal, but relatively small effort, get pretty good IDE support. And while my prototype is implemented in Java, I think that applies also to other languages. So if you implement already the language server protocol, you may as well add the, I think in my case, it's about 2,000 lines of code for capturing basic structures. And then somebody else can, with very few effort, add uh, good IDE support for another language by just kind of capturing information in the parser. All right. That's what I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. I can repeat the question. Thank you. Just a, a trivial example. Uh, it is very annoying when you use a, an IDE and you have got a pretty printer which is not reliable so that it uh, uh, doesn't correctly indent the lines because the pretty printer doesn't understand the grammar, just uh, guesses what to do. That's, that shouldn't be a problem with your approach, I, I assume. So we haven't looked into pretty printing or refactoring tools at all, so anything that actually modifies buffers. Um, you kind of get similar effects because there is nothing language specific in there. Uh, some things are not precise, right? And sometimes you could do better with language specific information about like lookup rules and things. Um, so yeah, there, there is that not knowing the language, um, it's some, of, some bits of a drawback. But on the other hand, with relatively few effort, and since I should be actually doing something else, um, that's all I was caring about. Uh, you get good enough um, tooling. But yes, you can run into X cases that yes. are annoying. So the next thing would be, which I'm a very bit skeptic about it. Uh, for instance, when you would like to uh, replace the identifier A within a block by B, uh, uh, do a, a bound replacement without touching anything else, no comments, no uh, literals, and so on, and do that in a re reliable way, uh, so that would not be currently not be supported. Yeah, we haven't looked into refactoring, mm. renaming, kind of. Uh, so anything that would modify the code, uh, we haven't looked into. Yes. So it's strictly code inspection, code navigation style features we have looked mm -hmm. at. Thank you. Have you looked into suggesting tokens? Like if you're typing? No. no. Right? It's auto completion you mentioned, but so this is just. We yeah. have code completion, um, and that code completion kind of ranks based on lexical locality. Okay. Um, so if you are at the object dot something something, you would get. So we, we have the notion of. Um, language elements after navigation, um, so that kind of restricts a little bit the set of proposals, um, but otherwise it's kind of proposing the closest things first and then everything else. Okay, so. thanks. Thank you, it's a very interesting project, but as far as I'm aware, as I am aware, there are also aspects of language servers that you cannot implement on the server side. Um, the basic syntax highlighting, not the semantic one, uh, maybe the extensions of files that are supported and, uh, and some things like key bindings or comment characters that you have to specify in each plugin for each editor. How, how do you approach this? So obviously we don't do basic highlighting, we only do semantic highlighting, but since we are in the parser, we have the exact information, right? Uh, when it comes to um, the trigger characters and things, those you kind of specify in the language server. Um, so that's, yeah, sorry, no, you're, you're right. It's not specified in the language server. In the Visual Studio Code plugin, it's uh, specified 
explicitly as part of the configuration of the plugin. Um, so we don't have any specific solution for that. Does it answer all parts of your question? So I guess that means that you, for every language to support, you still have to write the client side plugin, even though it's, it's very minimal um, for every editor. So currently the only thing I'm aware of is uh, a couple of lines of code, sorry, a lines of uh, JSON and the configuration of the plugin. So there, there is only one plugin for all the languages, um, but uh, yeah, you have to add the configuration per language. Thanks, Stefan. Um, it seems like weaving your language agnostic framework into the parser is a very sort of predictable thing to do. You sort of know where things ought to go. Could you imagine an AI uh, agent doing this for you rather than all your students? Hey, Could you auto-generate a language server protocol integration? <laughs> I don't believe in magic. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. One other, one other question to fill the time. Um, but I guess you've got to switch over your microphone, Sophie, come in. Um, so you did say that one of the advantages of this is you didn't have to change the AST. Um, but often you find people want a, a one AST that's closer to the actual source text and then another AST, particularly in something like Truffle that's actually being used for execution. Is that a problem or? Um, so the trick here is we barge in before the AST is constructed, right? We are capturing on the level of the syntax rules and the grammar, basically. So you do it in the parser, but yeah. So it's the parser, but not necessarily the AST. 